orbiting 250 miles above, the space station provides us with the ultimate view of planet Earth. From this perspective, we ask our guests to engage with six questions that orbit around wonder and stories of hopefulness. For the next few minutes, this is, is our wonder space. space. Welcome to the 112th episode of the Wonder Space podcast, which is an expression of a family trust called Panapa. My name is Steve Cole, and since September 2020, I have asked the same six questions to over 100 people from around the world. People such as Madison Adams and Gary Sheng from Civics Unplugged in New York, who in episode 65 talked about their work leveraging technology to empower young civic innovators to strengthen their communities and democracy. We are thrilled once again to be drawing from the wonder of Ask Nature, who look to nature for inspiration to solve design problems in a regenerative way. Here is another moment to help us rewonder. The large ears of rabbits and hares are good for more than just hearing the approach of predators. In the case of jackrabbits, which are actually hares, they're taller, live in more open country, and flee instead of hide, they also help them keep their cool, literally. When overheating in the arid environments in which they live, jackrabbits can widen the blood vessels in their ears, allowing a much greater volume of blood to fill the huge surface area of those large, thin appendages and transfer body heat to the surrounding air. This cooling mechanism is also an important water conservation technique, as it reduces the need for evaporative cooling mechanisms such as panting or sweating, which involve the loss of water. Humans taking a cue from jackrabbit cooling could lead to more dynamic heat exchanger designs that deploy certain functions as needed and adapt to ambient conditions to improve overall efficiency. Before I introduce my guest this week, I want you to consider what you would take with you if you had to leave your home tonight. If you were forced to live on the streets, what would you do with your belongings and important documents? This week on Wonder Space, we orbit with Rachel Wolf, who is the founder and director of a non-profit called Street Storage. Rachel recognised that the importance of storage had been overlooked in the homeless sector, and so in November 2018, founded Street Storage which today provides free, accessible and safe storage for hundreds of people experiencing homelessness. Last year, they saw a 300% increase in referrals in London and are now growing the work nationally to meet the demand for their services. With this expansive overview of Earth, I start by asking Rachel, if we could do a fly past over any part of the world that is significant to you, which place, city or country would it be and why? It's funny because I wanted to choose somewhere exciting. Um, I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I love visiting New York City because I think it's a better version of London. Um, and um, I adore Venice for lots of personal reasons. Um, and I nearly chose my grandmother's home because I love her more than the world. Um, but actually... It, it's not very exciting and it's not, it's not very, um, unusual. It's my home home. So my, my family home, my parents home in Gloucestershire. Um, it's a tiny hamlet where everyone knows everyone. Um, while that can be hideous at times, um, and I know I could never live there myself. Um, going back there immediately gives me a sense of peace. And I think as a charity founder, that's something quite rare. Unadventurous as this sounds, uh, Brimsfield in Gloucestershire is where I would do a fly past. Rachel, give us a glimpse into your life story so far with an emphasis on what you are doing currently. I 
work in homelessness and have dedicated a lot of my time to this community and this sector um, because my life story is pretty uneventful. Um, I'm, I often speak to my sister, who's a clinical psychologist, and I think we're both filled with guilt and a responsibility, a sense of responsibility as a result, I think, uh, of, of such a decent upbringing. Um, I have worked in homelessness now for 15 years, nearly. Um, and I'm currently the founder and director of a charity called Street Storage, which is the only UK storage provider of free and accessible safe storage for people experiencing homelessness. Um, so we run warehouse units and we also do advocacy and transport programs for um, ex-offenders, refugees, people who can't get back into work. Uh, so we do some some added value stuff, but really we are a, a a storage facility for people who have nowhere else to put things that mean things to them or enable them to work or remember family they've lost, all sorts of things. Um, and in terms of my life story and how I got to, to running Street Storage and founding Street Storage, I have an extremely supportive family and grew up in a very safe place, surrounded by love and a good education and good experiences early on. I went to a good school, got good grades. I went to Cambridge University, got a sort of good grade. <laughs> um, I, I managed to get a degree. Um, and I worked in the city as a PA. I lived and worked in London. I got married. I went to a local church where I sang each week and I got a bit involved a little bit in politics. Um, and I had some hobbies and some friends and my life was kind of, for my tax bracket, I guess you could say quite standard. Um, and I loved my job and I loved living in London. And I loved my life. Um, I loved bossing people around and I'm incredibly organized, but the culture just wasn't me. It didn't speak to who I was as a person and what I wanted to do with the privilege that I'd been given. It was a constant sticking point and I needed something with more purpose and something that would, I think I would be proud to say that I did day in, day out. Um, not, not least to get me out of bed in the morning, which I'm not very good at, um, and so I started volunteering with Karis Winter Night Shelter in Islington, and it was the highlight of my week. I was talking to guys on the street. Um, their stories were fascinating. They were kind of inspirationally resilient to me. And then I would go back to work and think, why am I doing this during the day? Why aren't I doing Wednesday nights during the day? Um, and so I took a job actually coordinating that seven-day uh, winter night shelter. And then I've worked in mentoring and befriending. Um and drug and alcohol rehabilitation and then I managed a day centre. So I've done kind of a lot of frontline work and then realised that there was a huge gap in the sector um, for people who don't have place to store their belongings when they suffer from uh, homelessness, street homelessness, eviction, going in and out of prison, fleeing domestic abuse. Did a bit of market research um, and yeah I said to Islington Council and some organisations in Islington where I lived at the time if you give me a building or if I find a building, I think I can fill it in about three, four weeks. And I filled it with 20 people's stuff in three days. And so after that, I knew there was a need. We found a, a free building given to us very graciously by the Church of England in Tottenham Court Road, which we still have. We now rent a 2,500 square foot building in Hackney for our offices and our storage units. We are moving into a 7,000 square foot building in Islington as our HQ. I now have a team of six people. Um, we've had a 318% increase in referrals for our service in the last year. Um, and we're now looking at replicating across the United Kingdom. So the growth has been really unprecedented and something I didn't really expect. And I often talk about falling into leadership and falling into founder syndrome and <laughs> imposter syndrome. Uh, but I am actually honouring something that I've wanted to do my whole life, which is to do something that I'm proud to say I do day in, day out, and to use my privilege for the good of other people and the good of the community rather than just myself. Where on earth is your place of reset or recharge? So again, I wanted to answer it really excitingly, like I did with, with the first question, you know, oh, my place of recharge is, you know, the Alps or something. Um, but it's not, it's my bath or my bed. <laughs> and I, I, I don't even know why I would need to justify that really to anybody. Um, I adore being in the bath. Um, I read, I watch TV, I call my friends. Sometimes I sleep very safely. Um, and it set, tends to separate the busy chaos of the day from the calm of the night. And I think for, for charity founders who have a lot of responsibility, um, a lot of worries and concerns and who are holding a lot of stuff, it's quite nice to have a boundary um, that you put in. 
Uh, but my favorite pastime is sleeping. Um, and I love the quiet reflection of the moments before you fall asleep. Um, I often have some really good ideas before I fall asleep and keep a notepad by my bed. Um, and I always say, people always say to me, are you a night owl or an early bird? And I always say to them, I'm afraid I'm neither. My ideal day would be getting up at 10 a.m. and going to bed at 10 p.m. <laughs> um, my sister and my partner are both insomniacs and I really value the fact that I can sleep. Um, I still have a teenage ability to sleep. And um, of course, working each day with people who don't have a place of rest or a place to call home, I am extremely grateful not only for the ability to sleep, but also for the fact that I have both a bed and a bath. What wonder of the natural world excites you the most? Okay, so you'll be pleased to hear if you've listened to the whole of this interview that I'm not going to pick something in my like vicinity <laughs> in, the, you know, in the United Kingdom. Um, so my first response to this was nothing with snow. I hate snow. <laughs> uh, but I chose um, a, a very kind of specific scene that, that really calms me. Uh, mountains, lakes and fir trees. So a little wooden hut with a fire looking onto a mountain, lake and fir tree kind of scene. Um, when I close my eyes and think of the natural world and what excites me, I actually think of Mount Rainier in Washington state. I climbed it while on a research trip into um, United States homelessness systems. So I was working out there and I was on my own and I, I decided to do this kind of trek up Mount Rainier. And the serenity that that gave me just being in that natural environment of just pure stillness, my life is not filled with stillness and my personality is not still and I think actually I really leaned into the serenity of that scene um I would also love to go to Yosemite National Park for the same reason that's kind of my um my bucket list Rachel what is your story of hopefulness that's not your own about a person business or non-profit who are doing amazing things for the world so I reflected on this a lot in advance of, of being interviewed on this podcast today. And I, I mean, it was a beautiful reflection, right? So effectively I got to, there are too many inspiring things and inspiring people for me to pick something. Sorry, Steve. That's how, that, that's how I, that's how I decided to answer it. Um, and I actually spoke to my neighbors at a dinner party last night about people they knew doing inspiring things in case they could narrow it down. Um, and it turns out that one of my neighbor's brothers founded STK, the steak restaurant, um, out of only being able to eat meat once a week due to poverty and to be a place that catered for women to enjoy proper steak without the toxic masculinity of steakhouses in the US. So I thought I'd mention him, give him a bit of a shout out today. And my neighbour herself is pioneering action-based safe spaces around equality, diversity and inclusion in law firms. Uh, last week, I attended a breast cancer fashion show, a uh, breast cancer survivors fashion show here in London, attended by celebrities and big brands that my partner's sister featured in. And um, that was hosted by the Future Dreams Foundation, set up in memory of two women from the same family who died within a year of each other and who've raised millions for breast cancer research. So even in the last four days, I can't narrow this down. And I started to see it as a sliding scale of inspiring people doing amazing things for the world. So my personal hero is Dolly Parton, um, the amount that she does for education, veterans, leukemia and dementia research, hospitals. She funded COVID vaccine research. She works in conservation. She goes to families affected by wildfires in person. And then kind of a step down from that, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not as fangirling over him as I am Dolly Parton, but Albert Monero founded something called Limitless, spelt L-I-M-B-I-T-L-E-S-S. -S, and he brings free prosthetics to disabled people in developing countries. My friend lost her leg a few years ago. And I mean, she was lucky in that she has the finances to afford prosthetics in different forms. But if you're in a developing country, you've got no chance and you cannot live your life. Julie Dean, who founded the Cambridge Satchel Company because I went to Cambridge University and their story is so cool. So she couldn't afford education for her child. And so she decided to design a leather bag on her kitchen table with her child. And now it's a multi-million pound business. James Harrison's one of my favorite people in the world. He's known as the man with the golden arm. So he's donated thousands of pints of blood over 60 years to save babies from um, a very rare disease. 
And so effectively, I got in this big whirlwind, this big spiral of there's too much good. And, and as a charity founder, I think I look to the good more than I look to the bad because there's so much negativity and negative press. So this is the world that I sit in. And so I actually thought that I'd finish answering this question based on something that my neighbor said last night. It's about our world, not the world. So our communities and the causes we believe in because that's where the real inspiration is found. So to the world, someone said, don't quote me on who, to the world you are just one person, but to one person you might be the world. It's about how we change our world and leaving our worlds better than when we entered it. Um, so for example, I have a very good friend and colleague called Sarah Lamperty who founded Showerbox. She converted a shower trailer she bought off Gumtree into showers and now provides hygiene services to 50 people a week here in London who are sleeping on the street. Simple, small scale, inspirational. And that you know, goes alongside with people impacting their world for good who don't get any credit, don't have any recognition. Volunteers in care homes, food banks, Samaritan call line volunteers, people who are single mothers working two jobs for the sake of their kids, young carers, people living in tough situations with humility and with grace and without fanfare. That is inspiration, as well as the Dolly Partons and the Albert Madeiros. And I think that's why the concept of someone else um, talking, highlighting, platforming and encouraging someone else's story, not your own, is so powerful and so important because our world needs a change of narrative from egotism, narcissism, negativity, uh, power <laughs> and to one of lifting people up, lifting others up and building a sense of a world of change and a world of good. And I think if we look at our own worlds first we'll be able to start that narrative from, you know, our day-to-day -day lives rather than looking at the, the bigger picture, which does still exist. So I saw it as a sliding scale and that might be a cop out of an answer, but that's what I'm sticking to. <laughs> Finally, as we prepare to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, what insight, wisdom or question would you like to leave with us? Oh, in classic Rachel fashion, I've taken all three because uh, I like talking. So uh, I'm afraid it's not that deep. Uh, and my answers will change as I grow and, and learn about myself and others and the world around us. Um, but the piece of insight I would say uh, to people listening is that you are more handle, uh, you are more capable at handling a crisis than you think you are. Humans are more resilient than they think they are. We don't get any training for the life that we have. And yet we do life. Um, we need to give ourselves a bit more credit and we can be good people and good forces in our world and the world. And then the wisdom was that therapy saves lives uh, because I sound all zen and, 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 it, and sort of able to talk about my growth, but that's only because I've done the work. <laughs> and uh, the question I wanted to pose, I guess, at the end is it starts with a strong belief that community in whatever form is the most important concept of human life. And it, community gives you the opportunity to give and receive wonderful things, whether that's a community of family, friends, religion, hobbies, shared interests, work colleagues, neighbourhoods, NCT groups, community of survivors, whatever it is. I love community. And the question I wanted to kind of leave people um, with, because we've been talking about our worlds and my world and, and the world, is um, what does community mean to you and how can you enhance what you give and receive from it? To find out more about the work of Street Storage, go to streetstorage.org. I want to thank Rachel for joining us on Wonderspace. Let's continue to share our stories of hopefulness that makes a name for someone else. We need them like never before. Thanks for listening.